Good morning, church. Can we stand for the reading of God's word? And Mordecai recorded these things and sent letters to all the Jews who were in all the provinces of King Aserus, both near and far, obligating them to keep the 14th day of the month of Adar and also the 15th day, day of the same year by year. As the, as, the days, as the days on which the Jews got relief from their enemies and as the month that had been turned for them from sorrow into gladness and from mourning into a holiday, that they should make them, make them days of feasting and gladness, days for sending gifts of food to one another and gifts to the poor. So the Jews accepted what they had started to do and what Mordecai had written to them. For Haman the Agagite, the son of Hamadatha, the enemy of all the Jews, had plotted against the Jews to destroy them and had cast pur, that is, lots, to crush and destroy them. But when it came before the king, he gave orders writing this, that his evil plan that had been devised against the Jews should return to his own head and that he and his sons would be hanged on the gallows. Therefore, they called the days Purim after the term Pur. Therefore, because of all that was written in this letter and of what they had faced in this matter and of what had happened to them, the Jews firmly obligated themselves and their offspring and all who joined them that without fail they would keep these two days according to what is written and at the time according appointed every year that these days should be remembered and kept throughout every generation, in every clan, province, and city, and that these days of Purim should never fall into disuse among Jews, nor should the comm commemoration of these days cease among their descendants. Then Queen Esther, the daughter of Abahal, and Mordecai, and the Jew, gave full written authority confirming this letter about Purim. Letters were sent all, to all the Jews in the 127 provinces of the kingdom of Aserus. In words of peace and truth, that these days of Purim should be observed at their appointed seasons, as Mordecai the Jew and Queen Esther obligated them, and as they had obligated themselves and their offspring with the regard, with the regard to their fasts work. There we go. Fast and they are lamenting. The command of Esther confirmed these practices of Purim, and it was recorded in writing. King Aserus imposed tax on the land and on the coastlines of the sea, and all the acts of power and might, and the full account of the high honor of Mordecai, to which the king advanced him, are they not written in the book of the chronicles of the kings of Media and Persia? For Mordecai the Jew was second in rank to King Aserus, and he was great among the Jews and popular with the, with, the, with the multitude of his brothers. For he sought the welfare of his people and spoke peace to all his people. May the Lord have a blessing on the hearer, the reader, and the doer of his word. I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. Amen. I bring you greetings in the name of our Father and our Son, and of the Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Yes. Say good morning, family. Good morning. Hey, it is good to be with you all. If you are new, first time with us, it's really simple what we're trying to do. Uh, we are called to shine the light of the gospel in order to make disciples all for the glory of God. Amen. And that's what we're after. We're imperfect, serving a perfect God. So if you're looking for a perfect church, this ain't it. That's right. But if you're looking for some broken people trying to pursue the Holy Father, then you might have found the right place. Um, hey, we are wrapping up our Esther series. It's kind of hard to believe when we come to these uh, ending. And for those who are new, Esther has been a story that speaks to the unseen God. God's name is not mentioned, unlike 
just like the Song of Solomon, as well his name is not mentioned. But yet, just because his name is not mentioned does not mean he's not active. And so what we've been seeing is how God has been active throughout this story of the, the Jewish people that are in exile under the Persian kingdom. But before we jump in, I feel pressed to share with you uh, in some ways to give a report about, man, what, this, what, what, what was taking place this time last week. Man, last week, myself and the staff, along with a few others, about five others from our church, went to a discipleship conference in Atlanta. And in some ways, I am still processing what took place, because what I believe is that we were part of a historical moment that if the Lord tarries, we will be able to say, where were you when this revival took place? In some ways, I'm trying to still take all that is overwhelming on the inside and how do I try to condense it and give it to you in a palatable way? And so I just want to share a couple of things with you all. There's some things that was confirmed that the Lord was already dealing with me personally. Some things that he also confirmed with regarding our church and the direction that we're going. But I bring back a few things that was beautiful and I want to share with you. It was 7,000 people in this room. And what was reminded, and I want to remind you, is there is something powerful when we are unified, yes. when we come together, and ain't nobody trying to jock for no power, no positions, no where's my applause. It was something to see. 7,000 what is led to believe believers on one accord coming together, unified, worshiping the one who created each and every one of us. And so I come and I say, may we be unified. Yes. May we come together in your presence. God moves when we gather together and we all come to worship him, seeking him. Yes. Even if you all are in different places economically, spiritually, emotionally, mentally, you name it. But we're coming together to the one ha who has the power yeah. to meet us where we are at and it was just a glorious moment. I was reminded that there is power in unity, especially around oneness of who God is. Next, I was reminded, in which I believe there's this language of the remnant. Dr. Eric Mason said that the remnant is those who went through and survived catastrophe. And for those, many of you all don't know the history of this church, and that's okay. But I look at what we've been through in particularly the last three years. Yeah. Come on. And I just believe, I just believe that we are a remnant of what God is yes. doing. Yes. When you look at Romans 11, it talks about a remnant or those who you're a remnant by God's grace. So make no mistake, we ain't a remnant because of me. We ain't no remnant because of the elders. We are remnant because for whatever reason, God looked upon this church and said, I will sustain you through your catastrophe. You, and the beautiful thing is that you all are a part of that. So with that being said, the next point is, and I say this to you in love, it's time to grow up. Amen. It's time to grow up. God made it very clear that there's work for us to do. And the enemy is going to come at us and come at you every way possible. Because how many of you all know the enemy don't attack nobody that's doing God's work? If you're doing God's work, he's going to attack you. But if you ain't doing God's work, he's going to leave you alone. Yeah. And so it's time for us to grow up. It's time for us to grow spiritually mature into him. It's time for us to reverence him even more. And that's another thing that was themed throughout there is that there was a reverence of God like no other. Esther has been reminding me and stirred my reverence for Lord in a new way. But oftentimes I think and I submit to you, we treat God like he's our homeboy and not our savior and our king. And so I just believe that when we reverence God, there was a way that you move differently. There's a way that you look at your brother and sister differently 
Compassion, mercy overflows because you were in the presence of a holy God and you reverence him like never before. And I say that to say is that we ought to pray, saints, because we think we got more time than we have. And the enemy is coming and he's here. And as long as I'm here and these elders are serving here, we are going to make sure we reverence the Lord as best we can. We're going to make sure that we grow up into maturity as best we can. And if you see that there's a difference in who I am, there is, because I just believe that I cannot be the same after experiencing what we just experienced. And so with that, may we pray fervently for all saints, as Ephesians 6 says, because the enemy is after us. And I'll say this before we go to the throne of the Lord, before we go to the throne. That leads me to this last point. Elections happening here in a couple of days. And I just want to remind you, no matter which way you vote, that's fine. This is not here to convince you to vote one way or another. But I am here to tell you. That the right or the left is not the kingdom that you serve. That's right. And so what if we've learned anything throughout Esther is this, is that it don't matter who's on the throne. Because God will always, always accomplish his plan. So whether your candidate wins or whether your candidate lose, at the end of the day, remember that our king does not sit on elephants or donkeys. But he sits on the throne. And every government official and every believer will all give an account for the way the office that they hold. So your responsibility is that no matter what happens on Tuesday, the outcome is that you look at your brother and sister with dignity and value because they're image bearers. And that at the end of the day, we make sure the kingdom of God is our primary concern, not the right or the left. Amen. So when you go back to your small groups or your formation groups or you connect with people, don't sit there and try to have unhealthy debates about what is this and what is that. Make sure the kingdom is in the forefront of it all. So if you would join me as we go to the Father in prayer. Father, we come now. Thanking you for who you are. Thanking you for your grace, for your mercy. Thanking you, Father, that you are on the throne and that nothing surprises you. I pray in this moment that you would meet every man and woman and boy and girl right where they're at. I pray that you would bust open the dark spaces of their hearts and their souls. I pray, Father, that you would minister to those places, that you would pour your spirit upon them that they would feel you tangibly, Father, that they would see you clearly in this moment. God, I pray that you would call to remembrance the ways that you have moved in their lives, the way that you are moving in our life now, Father. I pray that as I speak, whatever is not of you, that it would be silenced from my mouth. And I pray that whatever is from you, Father, that it would touch their hearts and they either would not say, here's what Pastor Miguel said, but they would say, here's what the Lord said. Yes. And so, Father, I am hidden behind the cross so that you can be glorified and magnified. Pour out your spirit upon this place. May we make big of who you are and little of who we are. May, we, may I decrease and you increase. And Father, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. And we all together said, Amen. Amen. What's your favorite holiday? Christmas. Christmas. That's right. Thanksgiving is, is, is just chopped liver now, right? It's like November 1st, Christmas, let's go. Um, but what's your favorite holiday? And that's just, you just want you to ponder. It's okay. And it's okay to talk back to. Y'all know that. You, ain't, you know that. What's your faith? I ask that question because we all have them. See, the Bible call them festivals. We say holiday. Same thing, different terminology. 
But I submit to you that when you have a favorite holiday, it's not just to remember, but it's for you to engage. You see, we have Martin Luther King Day, and it's more than just getting off of work. It's a day where people get together and march to remember that we are one because he led the way, or at least he was the face of the civil rights movement in some regards. We have Valentine's Day where we get all gushy and we, get, we, we, we break the bank to show our love as if, which if you're handling your business, that day shouldn't be unique if you're married, amen? And I'm not here to debate if these are pagan holidays or not. That's not the point. Just walk with me here. But then we have Memorial Day, right? We have Memorial Day is where we memorialize, we remember those who served, we remember those who gone before us. And so we go to the gravesite and we bring flowers and pay homage to them. We have the 4th of July where we celebrate independence and we turn up. You have Labor Day, which is a day, how kind of America, to give us one day to rest from work. <laughs> I say that really facetiously. Um, but you engage with working. You stop from working so you can rest. And then we have what is Thanksgiving that comes up where we will gather together and give thanks. And then we have Christmas where for believers we gather and celebrate the birth of Christ. You name it. But then there's the national holidays, but there's the personal ones too. Some of you have the holidays of your wedding anniversary. You have your birthday. Some of us have... And I say this a day, really a holiday or one where your loved ones have transitioned from here to eternity. And so whether they're personal or not, we all are familiar with holidays. And we all remember those days. And we don't just remember them here, but we engage with that activity and I come to remind you as we wrap up Esther what we will see the importance of is to remember God and to remember to be faithful the title of this message is remember God and be faithful we come to the end of this letter of Esther where We've been on a journey. These episodes have the highs and the lows. And it's very interesting how it ends where they just got through killing 75,000 of their enemies, the Jews did. And you look at this on paper and you go, it's just the date of Purim. And yeah, chapter 10 is reminded of how great Mordecai is. But I submit to you that Remembrance is important. Being faithful is important. And I believe the book of Esther, the author of Esther, wanted to remind us that certain things are important to remember. What we have here in this first movement is really a call to remembrance. You see, it says in verse 9 how, or verse 20 how Esther, I mean, how Mordecai recorded and sent a letter how he sent it far to those far and near, obliging them to keep the 14th and the 15th day of Adar. And, and then if you go down in verse 23, it says that the Jews accepted this. Mordecai wanted them to remember this date, as we would see, is the festival of Purim. When you look at the rest of chapter 9, it is a summary of really the whole book. 24 and on, it tells us how Mordecai went about devising a plan, but I believe there's more that God wants to see, see through here, and that is one, there is this call to remembrance. You see, I believe a call to remembrance is more than just, it's not just limited to the intellect. It's not just to remember the date, but really it's a call to engage. Because when you remember and how you remember things should and ought affect how you live. Yeah. Should. Just stay with me. Really, I would say remembrance is kind of tied to obedience and disobedience. Okay, another way to say this is that when one is obedient and one is disobedient, it is connected to your remembering and your forgetting. Okay, let me say this here. Caveat, I'm not talking about... The, the, the human mistakes that we forget, right? 
We're busy, we're going, we forget things, and that happens. That does happen. I'm talking about an intentional forget. I'm talking about one where you know what you should do, but yet you choose not to do it because you ain't feeling it. Or because what God is calling you to do is hard to do within yourself, rightfully so. And so what happens is that's what I'm talking about, this obedience and disobedience connected to remembering or forgetting. Let's look here at Judges here. I want to show you an example of this. Judges, particularly chapter 8. Look at this. Look at this. Look at this. Look at this. Verse 33. It says, as soon as Gideon died. You remember Gideon, the one that God called him mighty man of valor who was hiding in the wine press when he was called because he was afraid. This Gideon, this their leader, they're the one who was leading them. It says, as soon as Gideon died, the people of Israel turned again, which means this wasn't their first time. If you know the book of Judges, it's this cycle of they got someone to get them out of trouble. Then they ask for God's forgiveness because it's horrible. And it's this cycle of God forgiving them, but also experiencing God's punishment for their disobedience. And here we are, it says the Israelites turned again and whored after Baal or Baal, however you want to say. And they made their gods. Don't, that word whored is actually an intentional use for prostitute. It's one that they decided to go be unfaithful yet again. And look what it says in verse 34. It says, And the people of Israel did not remember the Lord, their God, who had delivered them from the hand of all their enemies on every side. Why do I point you there as an example is because it is hard to remember what God is doing and remember what he has done when you're too busy turning to the idols of your comfort. See, oftentimes, it's not that we don't forget. It's just that we're too busy turning to our bells, whatever they are. Because when grief hits in, when temptation hits, when hardship comes, or get this, when freedom and things are just good, do you find yourself turning to your idols? You know the answer to that. What do you go after first for comfort? What do you turn to? Again, this is a choosing to forget. And it's hard to remember what God is doing. It's hard to remember the call that we have when you're too busy consumed turning to your idols. Maybe some of you need to stop and turn back to God so that you can get this, get clarity and freedom in your life. Okay? We have the misconception that following Christ is going to be easy. No, it's not. It won't be. It will hard. If it's hard, it is. Because what God is calling us to is beyond ourselves. And it requires us to have a dependency upon him. But America got us drinking this water that you got to be strong and pull yourself up by your bootstraps. May that never be. But they forget because they turn to the idols but look at this but then also how do that's a disobedience that's they're forgetting but how do you have a remembrance here how do you have obedience what Jesus says he says if you keep my command if you keep my command my love abide in you if you keep you are my disciples so what does that mean that when we choose to be obedient we are remembering What God calls us to. Let me say this here, and this is for somebody in this room. Quit subjecting your obedience or the lack thereof based off your feelings. Too many of us, we don't feel like it. And this is what's wild to me. Wild to me. You don't feel like going to work, but you get up and go to work. And yet, when you know the things that God calls us to, And you know, and you know exactly when you know, because you remember, this is not of God. This is not what I'm supposed to do. This is not what I'm doing. And you choose anyway to disobey it because you ain't feeling it. 
may we never allow our feelings to dictate our obedience because our Savior didn't. Jesus didn't. He didn't feel like going to the cross. He said, listen, and get this, he knew the plan the whole time. Then as the time came about, he said, listen, listen, listen. (laughs) Father, can you have this cup? You sure there ain't no other way. Remove it. But he ends his prayer by saying something that should be a flagship in our life. Not my will, but your will be done. There's a call to remembrance. And may we obey and may we not forget. But see, what's interesting in this call to remembrance, the reality of this name Purim, this celebration, this feast, the name has deeper meaning. You know, it's not just limited to them exchanging foods with one another, as the text tells us, giving food to each other. It's more than just giving to the poor. It's more than the 75, did they kill the 75,000, those who weren't with them? Yeah, they did that. It includes that, but it's deeper than that. It's deeper than that. In fact, it reminds us the name is more than it's something deeper. The Purim is something deeper because the text tells us very clearly. One, it's a reminder that God dictates the outcome, not enemy. Yahweh, it's, it's, it's about him and him alone. When you look at verse 24, it says that Haman, the Agagite, the son of Amathada, the enemy of, the Jew, of all Jews, had plotted against the Jews to destroy them and, cast per, and had cast per, which that is lots, to crush, to have a genocide, to destroy them. What's very interesting, it's reminding us that God dictates the outcome. You see, Haman, if you go back and look in chapter 3, when he got all mad at Mordecai and he decided to say, let me not kill Mordecai, but let me kill all those who are Jews. What he was doing, this idea of casting lot was his form of divination. He was trying to cast lot to his little God, lowercase g God, to determine the will. You missed it. Listen. God is not going to allow the enemy to dictate the outcome of his people. Regardless of what they are trying to do, God's people, if you are a believer in Jesus Christ, the enemy is not dictating your outcome. So it reminds us, one, that God determines the outcome. He determines the lot. Not Haman or some divination, some demonic spirit that he is uh, trying to call on at that time. Which let me say this here, and I'll say this to y'all, and particularly I'm talking to believers. And this is this. Stop using worldly methodology to dictate spiritual outcome. Okay? I'm talking to the believers in the room because oftentimes we think that what God is calling us to is not sufficient enough. Right. We know that the weapons of our warfare is not of this world. It's, not, it's, it's spiritual. But yet we try to use worldly methodology, another way, demonic darkness to try to dictate outcomes in our life. Stop doing it. Because why? God has already told us what the outcome is. He already told us that he will come back again. He already told us that there will be no more crying. He already told us he's coming back on a war horse with, his, with a thigh tattooed on us. He already told us that he's going to cast the enemy into the lake of fire for all of it. He already told us how it's going to end. So quit trying to use these worldly means. I know they seem good, but that's the beauty. Or excuse me, that's the, the reality of the enemy because, you know, Satan disguised himself as an angel of light. And in the last day, people have a form of godliness, but yet they are not godly. Yes. And may that not be us. Amen. May that not be us. Not because we're better than anyone, but because we will stay into the presence of God. And he will have us to search our heart. Yes. And he will see the saying, God, search me, clean me, create in me a new heart. So we see and realize that God determines the outcome, Right. But it's more than that. We also, again, this name has more deep meaning. When you look at verse 22, look at this. It says, as the day of which, here it is, the Jews got relief. They didn't gain relief. They didn't earn relief. Relief was given to them. 
which means that God gave them relief. That's the reminder. He determines the outcome. He gives them relief because he is the one who is the giver. And then get this, he's into transformation. Because you see at the end of 22, it says they got relief from their enemies. And as the month that had been, here it is, turned from sorrow into gladness, from mourning into holiday. There is a transformational that's taking place. This holiday, Purim, has more than just breaking bread, giving to the poor, killing and slaughtering. It's a reminder how Yahweh is the one who determines the lot. He is the giver and he is in transformation. Do you know what's very similar to that that has a more deeper meaning? The cross. The cross, yes, does it save us? Yes, it does. But it has more than that. The gospel, if you would say, the cross has more meaning. There's a reason why God tells us to remember. Why does he tell us to remember? Because he says, pick up your cross daily. Why? Because we some forgetful folks. Pick up your cross daily is, is a call for us to remember God. It's a call. When you pick up the cross, it does something. It's more than, yes, he saved us, but it's a reminder of our dependency upon him. It's a reminder that we got to submit under him. It's a reminder that you are called to holiness because he's holy. It's a reminder that eternal life is found in him and not yourself. Amen. Amen. Pick up the cross daily. Because it reminds us that we need a savior. It reminds us that our home is not here, but that he's moving us to glory. So you got to pick it up daily, even in the mess of the world. Because God, this world is not ours. We don't belong here. And I submit to you, the more that you sit in the presence of God, the more you will feel detached from this world. The call to remembrance. Name. The name is something deeper. But then we also get to praise God that things are recorded. Praise God. God, that things are recorded and written. You ever had a conversation with somebody? And then you and y'all, y'all having a conversation and, and either you were trying to tell them who they are and what they did, or they're trying to tell you who you are and what you did. And you kind of go back and forth and eventually you go, listen, hold up. I can solve this. I got receipts, Right. You ever heard that language? Because you, 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 what you're trying to tell them is that I got proof that whatever we debating over, the way that you was acting or the lack thereof, I got receipts to show you who you are. I got receipts to show you what happened. And may we praise God that he got receipts in his word. If you would turn to Romans real quick with me here. Romans chapter 15 or excuse me, 14. Look at this. Things are written and we need to praise God for this. It says in Romans chapter four, uh, 15, excuse me, verse 4. It's on the board. It should be on the board behind me. Look what it says. For, who, for, for whatever was written in the former days was written for our instructions. And not just our instructions, but here it is. That through endurance and through encouragement of the what? Scriptures. Encouragement of your best friend, encouragement of your spouse, encouragement of your job. No, encouragement of the what? Scriptures that you might have hope. You see, it's written so that we can remember to learn from so we can have endurance and be encouraged and have true hope for what is to come that can sustain us in the midst of the already not yet of where we are in life. But see, there's other things it's written so that you can have a spiritual dependency upon him because Jesus said in Matthew 4, for what? Man does not live on bread alone, but every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. It's written because he says, therefore, in 1 Peter, I am holy, you are holy, 
because I am holy. You see, there's things that are written to remind us and to praise God but, 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 but about who we are and who it is. In fact, things are written to remind you who you are. First and foremost, you are a sinner. Yes. I hate to break it to you. I know you look good. I know your spouse thinks you are the best things in sliced bread. I get it. I get it. But the Bible says that all has fallen short of the glory of God. The Bible says all are sinners. The Bible says that, get this, on your best day, it's a filthy rag, a woman's menstrual cycle rag is the way it is. You got a problem with it, talk to God. Because when you live a life in the presence of God, you don't think how great you are, you realize how broken you are. But the beauty is that the holy God does not crush you. In fact, he calls us to a dependency upon it. But in order to experience the fullness that God has for us, we have to one, stop lying to ourselves to think that we're not sinners. And let me say this here. And then for some of us, we got a, there's a comma there, not a period. Because oftentimes we're too busy focusing on our brokenness and remembering how we're sinners, as we should, as we should. But it doesn't end there because the Bible tells us that what? We are forgiven. It tells us that there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ. It reminds us that when you're weak, his power is sufficient and made perfect through our weakness. It's a reminder that you are a redeemer, that you are blessed, that you are a child of God, that you are healed, that you are kept, that you are the light of the world, the salt of the earth. You are a overcomer and it says your book, your name is written in the book of life. You see, the Bible tells us who we are, but this is important here. Listen, it tells us who we are, but notice what all of us said. It has nothing to do with you because it's written about who we are, but it's written about the one who we serve. Because John tells us in one, it says, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. And then if you jump down to 14 and it says, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. The Bible is written about God. You are not the hero in this book. You are not the hero in the book. God is using you and me in spite of us. His grace and mercy is the unseen God working through fractured and broken people. The Bible is not about you. It is not about you. You don't get to be the hero. There's only one. It's Jesus himself. So quit making it about you. Yeah, we didn't get no amens on that one, did we? (laughs) Yeah. That's right. It is hard. But the beautiful thing is that God sees you. God sees you, even if nobody else sees you, he sees you. He knows you. He knows you by name. He knows the hairs that's on your head. He knows the tears that he keeps for you. He knows you. And so, yes, you will have to fight and ask God, God, help me not be so consumed with the glory of man, but more about your glory. You will have to say that out of your mouth. How do I know? Because I said it this week. Because as much as I sit in his presence, I have to realize I got filth in me. There's so much vanity in me. And you got to say that. Be honest with the Lord. That's the problem. We want to be honest with everybody else except the one who actually cares about us. Which makes no sense to me. And if that means you need to be alone with people and that means that you will lose friends, then so be it. Why? Because we're moving in a different direction. And guess what? You cry tears of pain and hurt. But guess what? He has already gone before you and he's with you. How do I know? Because I see people leave the church. I'm talking Lighthouse specifically. And I'm always wondering, does it have something to do with me? Does it have something to do with here? And it has something to do with this. And I thank God for my sister here because my sister told me, she said, listen, Miguel, I have been praying. Yeah, this wasn't in the notes, but I'm going to say this. She, she said her, her and Israel were praying here. And they were praying this, that we pray that God will remove people here. I said, you need to stop praying because it's working. <laughs> listen, we got bills to pay. You hear me? We got these, these lights don't pay itself. 
And she reminded me, she said, Miguel, God's going to have here who needs to be here. And I had to remind myself that I was caring about numbers. There's vanity in there. Because I'm seeing people making it about me. I'm not preaching this and I'm preaching that. And all the while, God's like, listen, I'm moving people because I am going to have my remnant that is here. And one thing that I've learned, when people go, let them go. Amen. Do not try to convince them. Your boy done learned a lot in the last two years. Do you hear me? But that's because I had to be honest with myself in my heart. And you got to do the same. Because it's not about you. It's not about me. The story is written about God's redemptive work from beginning of time all the way to the end. And he's showing how he's working through each generation. Bringing about the church. Maintaining his people. Doing exactly what he said in John 10. He says, I got sheep of this fold. But then he says, I got another one. Now here we Gentiles grafted into his people. Because he's a redeeming us. Praise God that we are peace to the whole. So we ought to praise God that we have the gospel every single day. That you can pick up this Bible here and go to it and flip to it and be convicted by what he says and be convicted and also but be encouraged by who he is and what he's doing in you. But in order to know and praise God what is written, you got to get in the book, family. You got to get in the book. My challenge to you is this. Spend time in his word. If you get all, if all you get from God is coming up here to hear me for 45 to 50 minutes, you are failing in life. Because his word is true. I am broken and infallible. Everything I say, I do my best to try to honor what God says, but I'm still flawed in my ways. But it's your responsibility to test things in light of scripture. So in order to praise God, praise God for the gospel. And I'm reminded to myself that it is not a bad thing to every day remind yourself of the gospel. Remind yourself of the gospel. Remind yourself to pick up the cross. Remind yourself that we are in a warfare. Remind yourself that this doesn't how it always ends. Remind yourself through the word. But lastly, or not lastly, next is that we get to remember To be faithful. That's our responsibility and all that God is doing is that we need to be faithful. We have to be faithful. Look at chapter 10, verse 3. Look what it says. Chapter 10, 3, it says this. For Mordecai the Jew was second in rank. To King Azuerus or King Xerxes. And he was great among the Jews. Mm, Thank you, Holy Spirit. And popular with the multitude of the brothers. For he sought the welfare, welfare of his people and spoke peace to all his people. Get this. I love this. His greatness is propped up by his heart of service. You missed it. See, see, you missed it. Mordecai is not great because he is because he because of of in and of itself. His greatness stems from because he served other people faithfully. He sought the welfare of the people. He spoke peace. Notice he wasn't, get this, Mordecai been staying true to who he was before he got the position. And many of us in this room go, I'll be faithful when you, God. I, you know how many times I done said that? Listen, we're going to talk because I, I, we're we going to talk because y'all holy, y'all got it together. You know how many times I done said that, God, if you give me this, I'm going to do this. All the while acting like what he ain't gave you is enough. The audacity and the arrogance of us to tell God what he hasn't given us isn't enough. The very fact that you're breathing, the fact that he wants to use you for a kingdom, that alone should be enough. I love the woman that was, went through the crowd because that woman said, if I can just touch to him. 
She didn't say if I could just, if I could just touch the him, get close enough, I know he can make us well. And then yet here we are. Got the audacity to be acting like what he's given us ain't sufficient enough. Greatness, there's nothing wrong with being great, but it's how you go about wanting to be great. Matthew, particularly chapter 20, tells us this. This is Jesus, Matthew chapter 20, starting in verse, here it is. 26. And he says this, it shall be so among you. Here it is. But whoever would be great, you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first among you must be your slave. Even as the son of man did not come to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. Your path to greatness is being faithful by serving others. Being a servant. Not thinking you're too good to pick up trash that you see on your way out the door. I know that's a small example, but you get what I'm saying. There's nothing wrong with being great, but be great the way that God calls us to be great. And be faithful with what he's giving you, what he, what's in front of you right now. Because I submit to you that if he gives you what you want right now, it's probably going to crush you. So stop looking, and I'm telling on myself because this is what I've done. Stop looking at other people's ministry and focus on what God has given you. Stop too busy questioning what they are doing and how they figure out the illegitimacy. Quit, quit doing all of that. Get in the presence of God, be faithful to what he's giving, consecrate yourself, and serve him faithfully no matter what. Because what we realize in 1 Corinthians, get this, and this is true, you ain't, got the, you ain't making the results anyway. It's God that's doing the results. Go and look at 1 Corinthians 3. Once I'm plant, others water, but God gives the increase. But may we be faithful to what he's given us. And I submit to you that the faithfulness comes from an obligation. Because if you look at Esther, if we go back to chapter 9, look at this. Look at this. And particularly, verse 26, look at this. Look, look. There's an obligation to this. It says in 26, Esther chapter 9, 26. Therefore, they call these days Purim after the term Pur. Here it is. Therefore... Because of all that was written in the letter. One, we're obligated for all that is written in God's word to live it out. Here it is, the second one. And what they had faced in this matter. And then it says, that's the second one. And two, and what had happened to them. It says in 27, and the Jews firmly obligated themselves and their offspring, all who joined them, those who decided to partake and become believers or become Jews. And get this, without fail, without fail, they kept, they would keep these two days according to what was written at the appointed time of every year. There is an obligation that when you are aware of what's written, of what you have faced, and what you have experienced, you are obligated to respond in a faithful way. Yeah. What I just experienced seven days ago, I feel obligated yeah. to consecrate myself that much more. Because I have experienced something in an encounter with God to where that if I don't feel obligated to do it, nothing's wrong with him, it's wrong with me. And if I want to experience more of him, get this, not more fame, not more people, not more bigger budget, not none of that. But what I want to experience is just more of who he is. I want to be in his presence. I want to have that relationship with him. I want to have that relationship that where if everybody leaves and if he decides to shut the door of the church, that I'm at peace because I have a relationship with him. There's an obligation to do that. 
And you have experienced it in your life where you have been, where you face what you face. God has brought you through what you've brought, uh, what you've experienced and you are obligated to be faithful to him because he's faithful to you. He's brought you through. So snatch in the name of God what the enemy is trying to hinder you and say that you can't do and be obligated to be obedient to God's word. Because let me tell you something, you can't do nothing about yesterday. You can't do nothing about last month. You can't do nothing about last year. You can't do nothing about it, but the grace of God. That when you remember that you are covered in his blood and that you have time, you can't do nothing about the past, but you can do something about today. You can do something about tomorrow if he allows us to see it. But you got to be patient because he's working on you and he's working on others. You got to be obligated because Romans, look at Romans, not Romans, Revelation chapter 2. You ain't got to go there. It ain't on the board. Write it down. Revelation chapter 2, verse 10. It says, be faithful to the end. And then... It doesn't just say that. Be faithful unto death. And it says, I, meaning God, Yahweh, Jesus, will give you the crown of life. Be faithful to the end. And he will give you the crown of life. It ain't just for pastors. It ain't just for elders. It ain't just for deacons. It ain't just for people that serve in the ministry. For those who are believers in Jesus, be faithful to the end. Because God is going to give you a crown of life. And with the elders and everything, we're going to do this and give it right back to him and lay it at his feet. Because you will realize that he's worthy of what he's given you, but you got to give it back to him. Praise God for that. And I cannot wait for that glorious day to where he sits up there and he says, you've been faithful to the end. I know you failed. I know you've slipped. I know you've messed up, but yet my grace is sufficient for you. You kept pressing through. Well done good and faithful servant. Here's your crown of life. And then you in turns will go, listen, I'm going to lay them at the feet and we're going to be having a Holy Ghost party worshiping for all of eternity. Be obligated. Call to remembrance. The name carries deeper meaning. We praise God that it's written. Remember to be faithful stewards. And this last one is remember the Lord's table. Remember the Lord's table. <laughs> Listen, <clears throat> they celebrated Purim and it said, that at the end of verse 22, it says that they send gifts of food to one another and gifts to the poor. What's really interesting is that the writer is doing these double entendres in different ways because the food is a reminder and they give it to one another as a communal perspective to remind them when they give food to them that your Lot is determined by God, not by Haman. And you know what's interesting is that when they have this, this is a festival that goes on to this day. It exists to this day. The Jews celebrate it. In fact, they dress up and they do characters and, 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 and when Haman's name mentioned, they hiss and boo, right? And then when Mordecai's name is mentioned, they cheer. But then it says that they drink so much that to the point where curse is Haman and blessed is Mordecai pretty much sounds the same. And we don't need to frown on them because we use any holiday as an excuse to drink and indulge, if we want to say. (laughs) But they give gifts to remind them or this gift of food to remind them their allotted outcome by God. And yet what's very fascinating is that it reminds us of a feast, a festival that we do every single Sunday. 
which is take communion, the Lord's Supper. See, here in America, we don't get to actually do any, it, the, the, the Lord's table is a real feast. It's like a spread. Yeah. It's like whatever you experience at Thanksgiving, it's a thing. But what's interesting is that we ought to remember the Lord's table or the supper or where you come from, the Eucharist, you name it. Same difference. We can theologically debate another day. But when you come together and you take that bread, when you look at what Jesus was doing, when he instituted this new covenant in the upper room with the disciples, you see it also mentioned in 1 Corinthians 11 when Paul talks about it. Jesus says this statement, do this in remembrance of me. And what's very interesting is that when you take the bread and the cup, it reminds us as believers that our eternal destiny or our allotted has been determined by God. So it's more than just a piece of bread. It's more than a cup that was, his blood that was shed. That's what it is. It's to remind us when we take the Lord's table that our current, that our destiny is different and allotted and been determined by what God accomplished on Calvary. Which is why we shouldn't just go through the motions when we take communion. But then not only does it remind us of that but the text says that they gave gifts to the poor in fact the table reminds us of the one who gave the gift namely jesus to the poorest of the poor namely us so the table reminds us of one our outcome and our end game is different because of jesus and it reminds us how that we are blessed in the spirit blessed are the poor in spirit for theirs is the kingdom of god because christ came and gave himself to the poorest of the poor You and I are spiritually bankrupt. And so that's why we take communion every single week to remind ourselves of what Christ has done, to remember the call, to remember that it's more than a name, to give reasons that we have to pray, to remember to be faithful. The table reminds us that Christ and Christ alone accomplished what we would never do. You see, the Jews and Esther, they needed help from the Persian, from the Persian officials. (laughs) Our king don't need no help from no politician. My God, you'll get that on the way home. But see, that's the thing, that he's conquered everything. That victory is in his name. It's a reminder that, guess what, all the shame that we have and the shame of those who are broken, guess what, was poured out on him and he absorbed our shame. And it reminds us of our eternal destiny. See, you notice something about, if you go look in all the Bibles, throughout the Bible, all the festivals that they have, it points back to what? God did. Yeah. 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 Listen, you're going to shout. We're going to have reasons to shout. Every festival points back to what God did. The Passover points back to what God did in Egypt, yep. right? You have this one, the festival of Perm, points back to what God did in Persia. But the table, the Lord's Supper that we will celebrate in a minute, guess what? It does what no other feast can do. It points back to what God did, but also points back to what God is doing. At what point, what he's about to do. It points back that we have a new heaven and a new earth. It points to that, or excuse me, it points that we will be transformed to the glory that we will see him one day. It reminds us that he saved our raggedy selves and that he's redeeming us right now, transforming us, and we will one day be fully glory, get this, with him beholding his face as we desire to. That's what the table reminds us of. And I can't wait for that day because that table reminds us that it ain't the most educated, it ain't the most affluent that's going to be in heaven. But guess what? There's going to be prostitutes in heaven. There are going to be crooks that are in heaven. There's going to be people that done sold their body in heaven. There's going to be people that done shady things. Why? Because they accepted who Christ is and you're going to think the one who has the appearance of God, why they didn't make it? Because they never knew him. So we are going to celebrate now the Lord's table to remember. He says, as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you show the Lord's death. Here it is. Until he comes. Because he's coming again. And so if you did not receive this uh, juice and wafer, raise your hand high. We have people coming around. On the first Sunday of every month, we hold them up high. Hold them up high. It's all right. It's okay. 
we take this collectively as best we can to remember what Christ accomplished on Calvary. So we don't just don't just go through the motions and we do it collectively because sometimes, again, there's something powerful when we do it all together. Coming on one accord. If you haven't got to hold your hand high, hold your hand high so we can get you. They're coming around. They're coming around. In first Corinthians, I'm going to read to us while we're getting these out. In first Corinthians, this is what Paul reminds us when he instituted this or excuse me, Jesus instituted the new covenant. In 1 Corinthians 11, in verse 24, hear this as this read. Hold your hands up. Huh? We're coming. We're coming. It says it's following. It says, twenty-three. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you. That the Lord Jesus, on the night which he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, he took the cup after supper, saying, this is my cup. This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. He goes and says, for as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. May you take the body of Christ that is broken for you and the cup of Christ's blood that was shed for you. May you drink and eat and remember the Lord's death until he comes. We're going to continue in our worship. For those who are physically able, if you could, please stand. We have an opportunity to continue to give at our tithe and offering stations that are around the room. But we have prayer benches, so we give our resources to the kingdom, to God first. We have prayer benches on both sides of the room. Come, kneel before the Lord, engage with him. Repent where you need to repent. Praise him where you need to praise him. Don't be alarmed if someone comes and put their hands upon you. That's just our prayer team praying over you and interceding on behalf of you. But may we worship with one voice, collectively, worshiping our Savior, our King, who is on the throne, And coming back again to get his bride. And I can't wait. And so may we lean in in the presence of God. The scripture says, draw near to me. And I will, as God says, draw near to you. Let us pray. Father, we come tenderhearted in your presence. And what better place to be than in your presence regarding all of our frailties and brokenness. You are delicate like no other. And so, God, I pray that you would just meet each and every one of us right where we're at. That you would speak to us, that we would leave this place knowing, hey, that was you, God. You show yourself. May you impart a scripture in our hearts. May the Holy Spirit bring to remembrance what you said to us. May we be faithful in praising you right now, Father. We thank you that we are different because of what Christ accomplished on Calvary. And so may we see that now as one church, unified, worshiping the all true God through our Savior, Jesus Christ, and by the power of the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. All those together said, amen.